Daniel chapter 9, and uh, let's pick up verse 25. Daniel 9, 25. Before we get started, let's go to the Lord in the prayer. Lord, I pray that you'll wash me with your precious blood. I pray that you'll fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray that as I teach your word tonight, I'll make it clear, that I'll make it understandable. I'll bring it down where everybody can understand it and get it. I just pray that you'll take and bless the teaching of your word tonight. I pray that it'll strengthen us uh, in our knowledge of your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now you know that this 70 weeks here is not 70 actual 24-hour day weeks. Uh, in other words, uh, it's not just seven weeks like we look at. It has to be split up in prophetical weeks to make it prophetic years. What I mean by that is there are several times the Bible will use a day to represent a year. And uh, that's the only way that this time period is going to match with what's being described in Daniel 9.25. Because there's uh, easily um, 480 years in between. Now there's some little bit of discrepancies there, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But there's no way it can just be actual weeks. Now take your Bible, you want to get a couple cross-references for examples of how the Lord does this several times. Uh, go to, first of all, go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Now remember, Daniel's 70th week is a time of making reconciliation for sin for the nation of Israel. That's what it's about. So uh, it's going to match the same thing he does to them in Numbers here. Numbers chapter 14 and look at verse 34. After the number of the days in which he searched the land, even forty days, each day for a year shall be shall ye bear your iniquities even forty years, and ye shall know my breach of promise. So when he punishes them in numbers, he punish them, punishes them a year for a day. And each day was to represent a year. Now turn to Ezekiel chapter 4. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, three hundred and ninety days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity of the house of Israel. Um, so he's... Uh, to bear it that many days, but stands for that many years. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed each day, verse 6, each day for a year. So when Ezekiel lays on his side, he's representing uh, years that they bear their iniquity. Okay, and each day is for a year. And that's obvious what he's doing here in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25 because that's the only way it's going to match with what he's describing. 
So you can assume that's what he's doing. Uh, you follow that reasoning with it? All right, uh, back to Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know therefore and understand that the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Now when was that? Well, that commandment is... Uh, the one that I will go with is Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah chapter 2. Now, there will be arguments on when this actual commandment happens because there's four commandments that goes out. But if you study the ones in Ezra, those are actually commandments to rebuild the temple, not rebuild the streets of Jeru uh, Jerusalem. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 2. And let's pick up uh, verse 1. Nehemiah 2, 1. <clears throat> I find it here real quick. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Yeah, that name. I can't never <laughs> pronounce that thing. It's definitely not said the way it's spelled. Right. The king that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, and said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? When the city of the place of my father's sepulchre lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldst send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchre, that I may build it. Now what's he asking a request for? To build the city. That's what Nehemiah is going to build. Now Ezra is about rebuilding the temple. Nehemiah is about building the city. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be, and when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace with, uh, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into, and the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So uh, that is the decree that goes out to rebuild Jerusalem. And uh, that's the one that I make as a beginning of the 69 weeks. That's the beginning. Okay? Now, there's a dividing of seven weeks and three score and two weeks. Here in Daniel nine twenty five, and I'm not exactly sure why that dividing is. I'm not sure why uh, why there's a division between seven. Why he doesn't just say three score and nine weeks, but he makes a division of seven weeks and then three score and two weeks. And there's got to be a reason for it, but I've never really understood what that reasoning is. Three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times. Now, if you ever read the book of Nehemiah, you know it's troublous times. I mean, they, they have plenty of trouble. And, uh, and that's the rebuilding. Okay? Now, that's supposed to go all the way till Messiah the Prince. Well, Messiah the Prince, everybody, you know who Messiah the Prince is, right? I mean, that that kind of goes that's an obvious one that's Jesus Christ so 69 weeks is going to go from uh, from the rebuilding of Jerusalem 
to Messiah the Prince? Well, the only way you can figure that is by years. And it's going to come out pretty close. Now, there's going to be some discrepancies because of the understanding of the calendars. You're looking at it from a Gentile cal calendar and not a Jewish calendar. And then there was a guy that messed around with the calendar sometime uh, that's after Christ. Well, uh, one of them fellows messed with it. And then there's arguments whether or not he really messed with it or if the calendar's right or if it's not right. And all this stuff. And if you really want to get into it, this book is going to be the one that I would recommend to read. It's called The Coming Prince by Sir Robert Anderson. It's beyond me. I cannot explain this stuff. I mean, it just, it goes over my head. All right? <laughs> that's just, but if you really want to get into it, that's where you can get into it. What I do is I just make it simple. Uh, I know that the time period where it starts, I know the time period where it ends. Okay? Messiah the Prince. Uh, the discrepancies that people may argue about will be whether or not it goes to the birth of Christ, which is going to give you way too short a time. That one right there wouldn't match. So the only two that is legit to even argue about is the baptism of Christ, which is the beginning of His ministry, or the triumphal entry, which is right before the cross. Now, if you look at, to me, the ex explanation for that is right in the context of Daniel chapter 9. Look at Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Well, that's the cross. Okay? When, uh, but not for Himself. Well, no, He was cut off for the sins of the world. Okay? So, uh, if He's cut off, and after the 69 weeks, it would make sense to me that the triumphal entry would be the termination point. And that's exactly where Sir Robert Anderson and a few others land you. That does all they figure it all out and they wind up right at uh, right at the uh, triumphal entry. Now there's a few that will take and put you at the baptism, but what every time I see somebody at the do go to the baptism, they're trying to prove either do away with the total 70 weeks. There's a book called um, The Great Controversy put out by the Seventh-day Adventist founder, Eleanor White. And she has an ending at the baptism and then she starts Daniel's 70th week at the baptism and does and goes right on into the first three and a half years of the book of Acts for Daniel's 70th week and then does away with the full 70 weeks because she's trying to do away with uh, Israel altogether and steal their promises and say all the prophecy for Israel has already been fulfilled. And uh, she'll spiritualize chapter 24 and put all of that in, fulfilled at the cross. And verse 24 of Daniel 9. Which, I mean, you can spiritualize it. You could fill some of them there. But bring in everlasting righteousness to make an end of sins. Did Jesus Christ make an end of sins at the cross? I mean, maybe for the believer's soul, but not for the world. And not for the nation of Israel especially. Okay? So, uh, that's just not going to work. Uh, Brother Donovan, the fellow that, one of the guys that taught me, he tries to take and uh, end it at the baptism of Christ and make the first three and a half years of the 70th week already filled, and then the tribulation time period upcoming, that only three and a half years left which that doesn't work for me either because I don't see 
in the passage here in Daniel chapter 9, half of the first half of the week being fulfilled at the time of Christ. And we'll discuss that in verse 27 here. That just doesn't work for me either. Okay? So I make it right... When I teach it, I make the... to Messiah the Prince to be the triumphal entry, and then after the three score and two weeks, Messiah's cut off, which is right after the triumphal entry, you have him being crucified. Okay? But not for him... Uh, back to Daniel chapter 9 and verse uh, 26. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. Now, that little comma point sure, sure makes a difference in that verse. Because you jump right from the cross to the tribulation. The prince that shall come is going to be the prince of Daniel chapter 11. And that's going to be the Antichrist. Yeah. He shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, that's... You say, well, what about... Uh, a lot of people trying to say it's A.D. 90. Well, um, the only thing is, if that's the case, then AD 90 would be the end, and that ain't gonna work. Because you got in during to the end with Matthew 24, you got Revelation. None of that stuff was fulfilled in AD 90, and a lot of Daniel wasn't fulfilled in AD 90, and you wasn't didn't have no covenant made with them in that early time period when Jerusalem was destroyed. So Jerusalem's going to be destroyed a second time. AD 90 wasn't, uh, or was it AD 70? Was it AD 90 or AD 70 when Jerusalem was destroyed? Huh? It's AD 70. I'm sorry. AD 70. Israel was supposedly destroyed then. Right? Huh? Is yeah. That what they say? And they were scattered throughout scattered. the nations. And they from then until 1948, they weren't a nation. Okay? So what a lot of people will do is they'll say that it was fulfilled. This was fulfilled then. But the problem is, is that's not going to match with what you run into verse 27 here. Now let's look at verse 27. And he, that's the prince that shall come shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. There's your last week. Alright, when in the New Testament did anybody confirm the covenant with many for one week? First of all, what covenant is it? Alright, now if you look at... Um, now let me get the verse... Uh, we'll get into this more in Daniel chapter 11. Daniel chapter 11, you have a... Uh, Daniel chapter 11, what you, you'll have is you have a history of in between Daniel and the Roman Empire coming to reign for the first um, 20 verses. And then when you start with the vile person, you jump up to the Antichrist. Alright. Now once you get to the Antichrist, um, it talks about him down verse 28. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against what? The holy covenant. And he shall do exploits and return to his own land. Now in your Bible, there's only two places where the phrase holy covenant shows up together. 
Now you have holy and covenant in more than one verse, more than two verses, but only one, two places do you have the phrase holy covenant, referring to a covenant as being holy. And the other place is in Luke, and I think it's Luke chapter, I'm going off my memory here because I didn't write this down. I really should have wrote this down. Luke chapter, does that thing do, do phrase searches? Can you type in Holy Covenant? Give me the reference. I think it's in Luke 4. It's right at the beginning of Luke, I'm pretty sure. Huh? Luke is where you think it is. It's in Luke one seventy two. Luke chapter one, verse seventy two. A couple chapters off. Luke chapter one, verse seventy two. To perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father. Abraham, that he would grant us unto us, that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear. All right, now that promise and oath that he gives to Abraham is a land grant, is what that thing is, that they'll dwell peaceably in a land. And that land grant it goes all the way from Palestine over to the Euphrates and down across from uh, the top part of the Dead Sea here across. It's a big triangle. Uh, you find the only time you find that they actually the Jews actually have that full land grant is under King David. Because he goes all the way to and recovers his border by the river Euphrates, which is all the way over. And uh, it has to do with the land. So when it says that he confirms a covenant there in Daniel chapter 9, what he's going to do is he's going to restore the land back to Israel. And somewhere in there, he's probably going to, part of it is probably going to reestablish the temple worship too. But I'm not 100% on that one. Because you know the daily sacrifices are being made so that's going to be restored. Whether or not that starts with him confirming the covenant or just a restoration of the land grant, not 100%. But I would make this covenant here in Daniel chapter 9, him confirming it, the Abrahamic covenant to the Jews. Now go back to Daniel chapter 9 and look at verse 27 and look how this is worded. And he shall do what? Confirm the covenant with money, many for one week. Now what does the word confirm mean? It means the covenant's already been made at one time. Right? He's just confirming it. If you confirm something, you reinstate something that's already in place, right? At least that's the way I understand it. Okay. Unless the word's used differently. Okay. So he's reinstating the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. Alright, so that's when he comes in in the middle of the week and sits down and says that he's God. And that's both going to be in Matthew chapter 24 and in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Alright? And he's going to cause the oblation to cease and for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate even until the consummation that, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now turn to Matthew chapter 24 for, and look at verse 15. And notice how Jesus Christ quotes this verse in Matthew 24. 
Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. When, there, when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. So that starts the second half of Daniel's 70th week, which is going to be what is referred to as the time for the Jews, the time of great tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble. And that happens in the middle of Daniel's 70th week. But Daniel's 70th week starts with the Antichrist confirming the covenant. And uh, I believe that covenant to be a land grant. He's going to give them a land grant. And he may start uh, have a few things with uh, the temple worship being reinstated on the dome with that confirmation too. Alright? Now, the overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. I've always kind of wondered what that means, those making something desolate. Uh, over, over pouring out upon the desolate, what I believe that will be is him martyring the Jews in that second half. Okay, I think that's what it's a reference to. The overspreading of the abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation. So he'll set up an image in the uh, temple and then he'll start killing Jews in front of that image and beheading them because they won't worship it. All right. So, any questions on before we move to Daniel chapter ten, and we'll get into this last week a little bit more in Daniel chapter eleven. But is there any questions in Daniel chapter nine? We we'll move on. All right. Let's go to Daniel chapter ten. Daniel chapter ten, verse one. And the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long, and he understood the thing, and had understanding of the vision. Now this vision's at, uh, obviously referring to the next two chapters, 10, 11, and 12. Okay? Uh, it's in the time year, uh, third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, which would mean that the other Jews have already been returned to Daniel. The 70 years has already been accomplished, and Daniel, as an old man, obviously stays behind in, uh, in um, Babylon. He stays in Babylon. He doesn't go back with the others. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread. Now uh, that neither came flesh into flesh nor wine into my mouth, neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. Weeks uh, that looks to be a partial fast. Are those weeks of years? Or no? Huh? Are those weeks of years? Are we still talking about weeks of years? Or are we no. Talking, just three, weeks? three full weeks of fasting? Well, if you make that year, that would be what? Dead. 21 years. Yeah, no, say, I don't think so. Say, I think, did it say he was fasting or mourning? Huh? He asked if it says if he was fasting or mourning. So well, he's mourning, but with the mourning, it's a partial fast in verse 3. I ate no pleasant bread. Now, the pleasant bread would be, uh, he's eaten probably bread of affliction, which would be unleavened bread, which you find that in Deuteronomy 16.3. Unleavened bread is referred to as bread of affliction. 
I mean, if you put leaven in it, it makes it more edible. So I would say that the pleasant bread just, is just referring to type of bread. We've been talking about weeks of years and it jumps into weeks again. So I yeah. just wanted to Well, you're changing a chapter. You're changing a complete thought here yeah. with the new chapter. So Daniel chapter 9, you want to end Daniel chapter 9, you're starting a new thought with Daniel chapter 10. It might even clarify verse, huh? verse 4 might clarify it some more. I guess in the 4 and 20th day of the first month, it might be, it makes you think the fast could have started about the first of that month. Which would be just days, about accurate. Yeah. And about day 24. You know, because, because it's 21 days, which is 3 weeks. Right. And uh, the first, uh, it's uh, the month, uh, it gives the month too here. Let's see. Uh, where was the month? Um, oh, the first month. It says, in the fourth and twentieth day of the first month. On the Jewish calendar, the first month is Abib. Uh, for the Chaldeans, it would be Nisan. The month Nisan. Which runs, if it, you correlate it with our months, it starts in the spring and it runs from about the middle of April to the middle of May. That's when their month is. And uh, that it, uh, in the first month is, yes, and I'll finish your thought and I have a question for you. And the first month of the Jews' calendar is the same month that the Passover happens and the same month that the crucifixion is on. So does God continue to use the Jewish calendar? If you're trying to calculate things, do you have to do it based on the Jewish calendar? Well, I would be correct. I would say to be accurate, yes. Okay. You you would probably be closer running with the Jewish calendar than with the so, Gentile guy. But him setting aside and which is very Jews. difficult for us to think that way. But would that be true even though he set the huh? Jews, would that be true even though he set the Jews aside? And uh, he's not dealing more than likely I would say yes it is. He sticks with that Jewish calendar. Okay. Just which curious. uh which but see the they had a way of changing it where uh making it correlate. See, we just do it a different way, but right. still comes out springtime Winter sprint the four seasons is a full year. Because it's astronomical. It's yeah, going right. to match to a certain extent. But uh, the other, because they add a month every so many years to instead of doing the five extra days. See, we do a 365 days for a year. They do a 360 day for a year. And then they add a month after so many years. And I'd have to go back and read up... Uh, on it. I don't think like a Jew, so it's hard for me to explain that. And where, where did they get that from? Though? Huh? Where did they get that from? Is that in Scripture, the calendar, the way they divided up the months? Is there instruction? Well, on? the names of the months are in Scripture, but I don't know if it actually says that. I think we're just going off Jewish tradition on that. And the reason I ask is because... I mean, I, I could be wrong about that. I'm not sure. I'm trying to figure, is the Jewish calendar a Jewish calendar, or is it God's calendar? Because if God I, I, told I couldn't to answer it. that, I don't know. <laughs> I really couldn't answer that. Uh, I'm sure the calendar got passed down to Adam and Eve. If he gave them the calendar, you know, this is the first month of the day you were born. I would imagine because time really began. Well, I know what he's trying to get to. Yeah. What he's so trying to get to is that, that the time. millennial will be millennium will be the seven thousandth year. And how do you figure that out from the beginning of time to the millennium? Right. To be year seven thousand. Some of the logic I think. Huh? The seven thousand years is God rested on the seventh right. day. You could and the millennium, the millennium is starts. referred to as we're, the rest. We're getting real close to six thousand years if we believe. Yeah. Which should bring you right close to the yeah. seven thousand beginning. But the thing is to know exactly when it really is. I think that's why the verse says only it the day of the hour it gets almost an hour. I mean, how do you know that? Even if you go by the Bible and calculate like 
you can calculate some by somewhat by the guy, how long the guy lives and the next guy lives when they're born and all that. But you know what you're not calculating in between there? The month differences. Right. There's no way to know. You're just, you, it'll give you a general idea. Right. And you know generally you're right around the 6,000 mark, but you don't know exactly. You really don't, right. You don't know. Ex if it was exactly, we're already past. So it's probably not exact. Are you saying they messed it up? Huh? Humans messed it up? Is that what you're trying to say? Yeah, we messed, right? <laughs> we messed something up. <laughs> and I think the Lord allowed us to do it just like He said, so you really are you're not going to know. I don't think, uh, even with, uh, I don't think it's exact, their calculations, uh, Usher is the best, from what I know, is the best one that figured out all the times, but even Usher's doesn't match with everything. There's this preferences with ushers too where it just you know, what, what I do is I'll just lean on the Bible as being the more accurate one and that's what I do with Daniel 9 from because what you have with uh, the commandment to rebuild the temple I mean the city and Messiah being cut off you have about four years discrepancy in between there according to our calendar four or five years discrepancy. And uh, that's what Sir Robert Anderson does, but he gives you a whole book explaining the discrepancy and how to figure it out where it comes out right. And it's just, it's too much for me. It's just too much. I, I, I just go with, well, the Lord has it accurate and Usher's got it wrong. <laughs> it's kind of the way I look at it. And that's why I get my cutting off right out of the text here as being the ending part is the cross. And to me, that's just a simpler way to look at it. Well, you know, that's the thing about Scripture, though, is um, God has a way of making it work no matter when it happens. Because they think back, in, like Matthew, I was looking for a verse while you were talking about yeah. something that you reminded me of where they asked him after the transfiguration, they said, how come they always say that Elias must come first? And he said, uh, Jesus answered and said unto them, in Matthew 17, 11, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer them. The, the, then the disciples understood that he spoke unto them of John the Baptist. So. If things would have been different. But he still says he's still going to come. That's right. If, but if things so, would have been different, if that been, would have been. He has it set up both ways. Yeah, he can he's make it work. He's got it set up both ways. And you can't get, you you can't play chess with the Lord. You're not going to win. I mean, he's got it figured out where when they argue with him, say there's, he's like, no, there is a discrepancy. And he'll be able to explain it all. And just, he'll probably make an idiot out of a lot of, uh, Bible professors, <laughs> but uh, but it's it's a uh, to know exactly what year you're in right now. If it can be figured out, it's going to be in this Bible. But uh, I don't know that it can. I really don't. Uh, the first month is when Daniel's praying, which I think is interesting. Uh, I've always had the suspicion that the rapture will happen in the springtime. I don't know that 100%. It's just there's some verses in Psalm of Solomon and some things that indicate that it would happen in the springtime. And I think it will happen around the time of the Passover. But uh, that's just a guess. I don't know that. But, uh, but that's... That's why this is somewhat interesting to me here. Uh, which would also put the uh, second advent happening at the same time. All right. Uh, verse 4. In the fourth year and twentieth day of the first month, as I was sat by the side of the great river, um, which is Hittichel, that's a. Uh, Chaldean name for the Tigris River. 
It's going to be the same as the Tigris River. Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed and linen whose loins were girded with fine gold of euphaz. His body was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of lightning, and his eyes as the lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass, and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. Now that description is the same, uh, similar to what John gives in Revelation chapter 1 of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the flames of fire will match Revelation 19, the eyes of fire will match Revelation 19.12, where he comes back with eyes like fire. Okay, so it looks like the appearance, it's a, a appearance of the angel of the Lord to Daniel in his glorified state right here. And uh, we're going to have to stop there. Okay. So if you want to read Revelation chapter 1, 10 through 17, and you'll see how much it, the two visions match. We'll pick up verse 7 next week.